Hello and welcome to the Friday, May 17th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Sonnets Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier came across an interesting attack taking advantage of authenticated vulnerability scans. In this particular case, the attacker was uh, trying to do an NTLM relay attack. Uh, now an NTLM relay attack does need an authenticated user that actually logs in into a system in order to then relay the connections and uh, that way take advantage of credentials. The user being used here happened to be the vulnerability scanner. Now, the advantage of an attacker using a vulnerability scanner is that first of all, the credentials usually work with pretty much all systems on the network. Secondly, they're sometimes elevated credentials in order to accurately assess the target system for security vulnerabilities. Also in monitoring connections from the vulnerability scanner to many hosts in your network may not really show up as an anomaly because that's what vulnerability scanners do unlike any other user that usually only logs in to a couple different systems in which case uh, well it sort of shows up if you're looking for it and that's sort of one of the standard anomalies that many systems look for where you have one user connecting all of a sudden to many different systems. Not too much you can do about this. Uh, you do want a vulnerability scanner. You do want it to authenticate itself. The real fix here is to prevent these NTLM relay attacks using SMB version three and enabling SMB signing. And remember, it may not be that easy to pull off the attack without the vulnerability scanner, but of course it's still possible. So it's not the vulnerability scanner really sort of being necessary here for the attacker. And Aaron won an important court battle regarding the fraudulent transfer of IPv4 addresses. Due to IPv4 addresses being in short supply, IPv4 addresses of course have been transferred between companies, but in this case the IP addresses were apparently obtained solely in order to commit fraud, in particular to send spam. Now IPv4 addresses of course are worth real money these days. Uh, these 750,000 addresses go probably for anywhere sort of around 10, maybe 15 million dollars these days. And there is no surprise that some people go th to some lengths in order to get to IPv4 addresses. In this particular case, uh, the company or the entity behind uh, this scheme did set up uh, 11 different shell companies, all with uh, fake business registrations and CEOs and the like, and use that to obtain IP addresses from Aaron under its waiting list policy that's currently effective. Once they obtained these addresses, uh, they then resold them to spammers, which of course is against the Aaron IP assignment agreement. Now, this is the first time that Aaron actually went to court and uh, got essentially a judgment that allowed it to take back these addresses. Aaron is also owed about $350,000 in legal fees. In addition to the civil case, there is also a criminal case against the individual that is behind the scheme. And as part of this case, they have been charged in federal court with 20 counts of wire fraud. And for the second time this week, we are getting patches from Cisco. This time the Prime Infrastructure and the Evolve Programmable Network Manager Remote Console or EPN Manager are affected. One of these vulnerabilities, CVE 2019-1821, does allow an unauthenticated attacker that has network access to affect the administrative interface. The two additional vulnerabilities do allow an attacker to elevate privileges, so they do require valid credentials. Not a lot of details beyond this. They do affect the web-based management interface in these products, so please don't expose them to the open internet. 
And a Usenix paper describes an interesting and somewhat scary attack against automatic landing systems found at most modern airports. These instrument landing systems are essentially radio beacons that are used to tell the plane whether or not it is approaching the airport at the right angle. Well, these uh, radio beacons, of course, are pretty simple signals that can be spoofed using off-the-shelf software defined radio equipment. The tricky part here is not so much that you can send a signal that looks like an ILS signal. I think that's uh, pretty obvious. It's a simple radio beacon. But the tricky part here is to actually send a signal that will then be detected as a deviated or incorrect ILS signal and then could potentially lead to the plane being misled. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.